Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to today's video. If you're new here and you enjoy horror stories, consider subscribing down below and clicking the notification bell. Can we get 600 likes on today's video? Let's begin. Our family was pretty dysfunctional. We didn't get along very often, and when we did, mum and dad were forcing us all to go out on this family holiday to get together and make things up. There was me, David, Elsie, and mum and dad. I was 17, David was 22, and Elsie was 17 as well. The problem with this whole holiday was the fact that I wasn't looking forward to it. We had this mandatory once a year holiday where dad would book the family either an airbnb or some kind of holiday rental. The idea was to just get a change of scenery, a breath of fresh air, but it never helped. If anything, it just made arguments and everything more stressful. Heck, I went along with it though. What else was I supposed to do? I was 17. There was no way mum and dad were letting me stay in the house alone. I tried that when I was 14 for that year's holiday. Didn't work too well. I ended up spending the whole drive crying because mum and dad dragged me out of the house. I tried to hide. That didn't work either. There had been some holidays better than others, I'll be honest. Giving my dad the benefit of the doubt, he wasn't the best at picking the nicest destinations. He tended to like things far away, in nature. We did camping a couple of times, and we also stayed in some cabins and lodges. Obviously they were all rentals, and the point was, we would stay for around two, sometimes even three weeks, with our longest holiday being a whole month long, during the term off school, when we had the summer. This particular holiday was in 2018. Dad had rented out another log cabin. Yeah in the middle of nowhere. So it was out of state, in a place called Michigan. He liked the idea of going to Lake Michigan and doing a bunch of water sports and these dumb activities that he had looked up. Most of the holidays were just for him, as he would often find things he wanted to do. That's how I saw it. He found this holiday rental on Craigslist, because apparently Airbnb didn't really have any decent places going in the Michigan area. I thought there was a load of nonsense, because as soon as I logged in, there was plenty, so I don't know what he was on about. He showed us all one evening the lodge that he was looking at. I say lodge, it basically was a cabin, same thing. It was around three to four bedrooms, so pretty big, not your typical size cabin. It had been renovated and basically had add-ons and made to look like a big family home, basically. It was surrounded by trees. It looked like it was in the heart of a forest, but my dad said it was part of a trailer park, so apparently it was surrounded by a bunch more. Me and my brother and sister didn't really get much say in whether we actually wanted to go. Obviously I explained that all at the beginning of the story, but the reality was he showed us but didn't really say, do you want to go? It was more like, we're going here, look, get ready. He gave us a few weeks to basically plan it, because I had a really social life. I had a bunch of friends and a lot of clubs, including sports, athletics, track and field, and I did a whole bunch of other stuff outside of school. Because of that, I had to cancel a load of events just to go on this dumb holiday in the middle of a forest with my dad. The three weeks went by quicker than I could even blink my eyes. I cancelled a bunch of events and before I knew it, I was literally there in my bedroom at 5am in the morning with dad yelling at us from the other room saying we're going to be late. I packed as much as I could, makeup, clothes, extra snacks, I even hid a bunch of stuff that they would probably be annoyed if they saw I brought. Basically I bought two whole suitcases worth. It was alright. Dad's truck was huge and could easily handle all the bags, but I was by far the highest maintenance of the whole family. I hated the idea of not having any proper electricity, any proper nice clean toilets, or just not a home. Well, I'd packed my bags at this point and Dad comes in my bedroom and helps me lift them into the truck. 
After that, my brother and sister end up chucking their tiny bags in the truck, with me looking at them in shock, thinking in my mind, how the hell are you going to live out of that for a whole month? Well, they did. We ended up getting on the way quite late. It was around 7 in the morning, but Dad planned on leaving at 6, by the very latest. I tried explaining to him that it was a Craigslist ad, not some 5 star hotel that would kick you out if you're late or misbehave. The truth was, the person wouldn't really care, as long as we still paid what we owed them for the month. Dad wasn't having any of it, he was stressed out big time, and I reckon he got no sleep the night before, just fretting about the whole thing. The drive took almost a whole day from where we lived. It was almost across two states, it was like one and a half from what I can remember. Obviously no one actually goes out on the first day of a holiday if they've travelled the whole day. You just get knackered. Flying planes you get jet lag. Well, what's it called? Car lag? Is that even a thing? Well, I felt it. We all did. When we arrived, the place was exactly how I pictured it in my mind and looked exactly like the photos Dad had showed us on the computer that evening sat in the living room. When we pulled up, Dad was driving just crazy slow for some reason. I don't know if it was the gravel track, but there was something about how slow he was driving. I guess he knew the number of the cabin we needed to stop at, and there was at least 20 that we had already passed, and he seemed a bit confused. Every cabin looked completely empty. There was no one there, no families. Now remember, this was during the heart of the school holidays. Yeah, bit suspicious. Well, we kept going until eventually we come up to the one that my dad says is the correct number. Outside was an elderly man raking up a bunch of leaves and pine needles that had fallen from the trees above the cabin. Dad told us to stay in the car as he got out to ask the guy. It turns out the guy owned the whole park and he was preparing our cabin as apparently we were the only ones that had booked it that summer. I don't know if he said the only ones that summer, but I'm pretty sure he did. I remember everyone just staring at each other, and when I say everyone, my brother, sister, and mum. We all just turned to each other because we could hear my dad talking to the old guy. We heard him clear as day mention that we were the only ones on the site. After this, dad pulls the truck in next to the cabin, and the guy gives us the keys and explains a couple ground rules. He said we can't have fires inside, etc. A bunch of obvious stuff that the average person just would know to do, i.e. common sense. It took him no more than around 10 minutes to show us round and explain the rules, and after that, the guy just walks off into the distance. No truck, no car, not even a bicycle. From the entrance, it must have been 20 minutes of just driving past cabins, so I have no idea where this guy went, but from what I could see, he walked out into the middle of the forest. After he left, we settled in. I unloaded my bags, and we each had our own room. There were three rooms, one for me, one for my brother, and one for my sister, and my mum and dad slept in the living room. It doesn't make much sense explaining it, but the living room was also technically a bedroom. It was like a big sofa that could be pulled out into a bed, and it just so happened their bed was way bigger than ours. Well, after all this, the food was pretty good. We ended up cooking some food and having a barbecue a couple times each night. The first few days went by really well. We did a bunch of hiking and exploring places. There was something about that cabin that made me sleep like an absolute log. Pun not intended. The reality was, I would wake up feeling so refreshed, so calm, and almost every morning without fault, I'd be woken up by the birds tweeting and the nature outside, rather than a nasty alerting alarm screeching in the side of my left hand ear. Everything was going so smoothly until we got halfway through the first week. Everything about the cabin looked new, like even the wood itself looked like it had just been bleached and recently laid. The foundations looked strong, no, I didn't say that. My dad said it. I'm a 17-year-old girl at the time of this and had no idea about architecture or building. Dad just kept banging on about it the whole time for the first three days, so I got it from him. 
It was nice though, I'll be honest. The place was big, it looked built well, and as I said, I was sleeping like an absolute baby every night. But, to bring us back to the issue of the third day, something started to smell around the whole house. Initially, I noticed the smell because we were all sat in the living room, i.e. on mum and dad's bed, and we were eating some dinner. I can't remember exactly what we were eating, but we were sat around just chatting. There was no TV in the cabin, because it's in the middle of nowhere, and the aerial can't really get any signal, amongst the trees that were about 80 feet tall. After this, we had to start chatting, and this is when I noticed it. It was me first, and then I asked my mum and dad, and my brother and sister, Can you smell that? We're halfway through our food, and something just smells so off. Mum starts sniffing the food she just cooked, as if she thinks maybe it's out of date, or she's used some gone off beef or something. It wasn't that. She checked a bunch of other food that we bought in the fridge. Obviously that wouldn't have gone off, it was all fresh and we'd only just bought it on the first day of going there. So we started walking around the whole cabin, sniffing everywhere, like dogs catching a scent. We just couldn't put our finger on it, or our nose. It was getting stronger though, we just forgot about it that night and finished our dinner, but as the fourth day came round, the smell was almost unbearable to the point where I was starting to gag uncontrollably just by getting whiffs of it. Eventually, things started to get so bad that we were considering contacting the owner. He'd left a number on the magnet attached to the fridge. He said only call it for emergencies or serious questions. My dad was this close to calling him when we found out what the smell was. Come the sixth day, my mom was walking up and down the hallway at the cabin, just outside both of our rooms. She quickly calls us into the hallway as if she's found something. There was an element of shock in her voice as she called us all to come out. Look, what the hell's this? She looks down and starts doing this weird double step on the floor. I honestly thought she was about to bust out a bunch of dance moves and show us. She started rocking backwards and forwards, and there was a creaking noise coming from down below her. Then, she made us put our attention onto how the wood looked. There was a seam. I don't know how big, but it was like a door. A door that had been merged in with the floor. A trapdoor. She was doing that rocking thing just like if you step on a drain or a cover, the ones they use to cover pipelines underground. When they're loose, you can make them make weird noises by stepping on and off them because the frame is loose. Well, very gradually, we got that with this floor. And the harder we looked, the more we'd see it. The seams and gaps of a trap door in the very floor we'd been walking over for almost a week. And on top of all this, when we put our nose to this trap door, it stunk of the very smell we had been smelling for the past few days. The smell that had making me gag uncontrollably. Dad told Mom to stop immediately. Then she said that we would ring the owner. That's exactly what Dad did. He picked the phone up and then got the owner to come down. He must have not told him what was wrong because the owner came down and seemed completely normal. This time he did come down on a mini buggy thing, the type of buggy the wardens use on golf courses and campsites. He turns up with a cap on and some smart grey trousers looking like he's legit just played golf. He knocks on the cabin door and my dad answers bringing him in. We explain there's been an awful smell and then my dad brings him over to exactly where the trap door is. My mum points with her finger to the floor exactly where the door is, and the man freezes. After what felt like 10 to 20 whole seconds of silence, the owner looks up at us and says, You need to leave. Um, I've just got calls that someone's booked the cabin, so I need to do some changing of my schedule. Please can you leave, I'll give you a refund. Those literally were his exact words. 
As awkward as they were, my mum and dad looked at each other and knew that we weren't going to get involved in whatever was under that door. Dad said okay, we'll leave, and with that we packed our stuff up as the guy waited outside leaning against his buggy, looking like he was crapping himself. We got in the truck and packed everything up in no more than 10 minutes. We walk out and don't even say bye to the guy. This is the most awkward moment of my entire life, and on the whole journey back we were all contemplating what the hell was under the floorboards. A body? Something rotting? The smell was horrid. I'm kind of glad we never found out, but the owner knew what it was, and something had gone horribly wrong. Twenty-three female. I was lying in my bed one Sunday morning, just scrolling through my phone. The night before had been a blur, I had been out partying with my friends. Life was a bit too much at this point, and I had been struggling quite a lot living day to day. As I was scrolling through my phone, I was just looking at the usual things, Instagram, TikTok, Dumb stuff really, just brain numbing and mind consuming. My usual routine at the weekends would be to just do this and procrastinate for hours and then eventually get up and make some breakfast. Well, something caught my eye. I came across an advert on Facebook which showed me about Craigslist, basically just local jobs in the area. I didn't need a job but I was curious as to see what kind of things were going. So I clicked on the ad which brought me through to Craigslist. Once I got through to Craigslist, I was just scrolling through the different jobs in my local area. Cleaners, dog walkers, house sitters, a bunch of other random things and odd jobs. It was quite interesting to read the ads, but after all I got bored and went back. I was now on the homepage of Craigslist and I was looking at all the different sections you could click on. One section caught my eye, missed connections. I clicked it and then tried my best to look through. What I saw were thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who were looking to catch up with others that they once met in their life. Some people missing, some people just forgotten. Now that had to be the most interesting part of the entire Craigslist website in my opinion. It was fascinating reading through each one and reading the description as to how this person knew the one they're looking for. I must have spent a good 10 minutes scrolling through and clicking on each individual misconnection. Eventually, I came to the second page. After this, I remember having a complete brain freeze as I scroll past one of the ads and it's me. The ad showed a photo of me from when I was 16 years old. At first it didn't process, I just kept scrolling, but around one second after I'd scrolled past it, my mind woke up. I scroll back up and sure enough, it's me, my full name, and where I'm from. Chills ran down my spine as I was now more intrigued to see who the hell was looking for me, rather than why I was on there. I had just been jolted out of my state of procrastination and laziness of just lying in the bed at the weekend morning. My heart was now racing and I could feel the adrenaline pumping through my veins as I was beginning to wake up more and more every second. After this, I went over and started reading through the ad. On the ad, it claimed that it was one of my old school friend's mums. I used to go to high school with a girl called Becky. I was quite close friends with her, but not really best friends. We were in the high school netball team and also did a bunch of soccer together. We were quite sporty back when we were at high school, but I couldn't understand why her mum was looking for me. It didn't make any sense. I got the worst vibes ever from looking at this ad 
and although there was a number to ring Becky's mum, I felt like that would be a really bad idea. Instead, I decided to search Becky up on Instagram and Facebook. I tried Instagram first, opening a new tab on my phone. There was no success. I know that people on Instagram tend to use things like abbreviations and nicknames, so there was no hope there. Secondly, I tried Facebook, typing in her first and what I remember to be her last name. Sure enough, she comes up. She looks slightly different, because it's been years now, we're talking almost 10, like 7 or 8. At this point, I decide to message her and send her a friend's request. To my luck, she accepts it almost instantly and sends me a hey with a winky emoji. I decide to call her ASAP through the messenger app. She answers and I explain how I haven't seen her in so long but I had something really important to ask her. She says what is it? And I say that I've seen a Craigslist ad for a missing person, Miss Connections, of me. The person who posted the ad was anonymous but claimed to be Becky's mum. In the ad it claimed that Becky had been rendered disabled and that she was now paralysed from the waist down. The ad mentions that she was involved in a car crash a few years back and that since then she has really been depressed and struggling with her life. The ad was a bit misspelled and that's also what gave off red flags. I was on the phone explaining everything to Becky, going over all of it, and when I said that she had been rendered disabled, she just started laughing at me. She was like, no, what the hell are you on about? Well, I sent her the link of the ad, and then she stopped laughing. We are still on the call at this point, and she's now clicked the link as I sent it to her through Messenger. What started as a friendly call had just gone awkward and almost silent. I could hear her clicking on it as she now brought it up on her laptop. There was a number on the ad and I told her that I might call it. She said it all seemed really sketchy. How could whoever posted this know that we were friends in high school? She went and asked her mum just in case and her mum said nothing about it, claiming that she had no idea what anything was and hadn't even used Craigslist in her entire life. That ruled that out completely. Now we had to figure out who had posted this and what they wanted. Whoever it was would be taken seriously by both me and Becky because they knew information about our past that a stranger shouldn't know. It was the weekend, so I asked Becky if she wanted to come round and we could make the call together. Along with catching up, we could get to the bottom of all this and if need be, contact the police regarding the issue. Well, I now had the dose of adrenaline I needed to get the hell out of bed. I threw on some clothes and quickly brushed my teeth before Becky knocks on the door 20 minutes later. She only lived down the road a few blocks away. I let her in and I greet her. She says hi to my parents because at the time I was still living with them and my dog Bojo comes over barking like mad or loopy. Bojo had never met Becky as we got Bojo when I was 18 and I stopped seeing Becky when I was around 17. After this, the situation went quiet as I now had to explain why Becky had come round to my parents. That was awkward, but after that we said we'd deal with it ourselves. Dad said we needed to call the police ASAP because whoever posted this was either someone that knew me or someone that was stalking both of us. But we were intrigued to just try and call the number before contacting the police. I guide Becky into my bedroom. She sits down in the chair at the edge of the room. I sit on my bed. We sat there in silence for a few seconds before I say, let's do it. I pull up the ad on my laptop and look at the number. It's a mobile number, so I get my phone out and start dialing it, slowly, while shaking. Halfway through dialing it, Becky says stop. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe your dad's right, we should just contact the police and let them deal with it. What if they can track your phone or something? Hmm, it made sense, and once again, I was scared, but I was so intrigued. There was something about it. I just wanted to know. 
who it was, how they knew about me and Becky. Finished dialing the last three digits of the number. I click the green call button, and with that, the phone starts dialing. We go silent as I put the phone on loudspeaker. The phone called for around 5 to 10 seconds. Eventually, there's the sound of someone answering. Exactly after the sound of someone answering goes over the speakerphone, there was silence. Eventually, I could hear the ever so slight sound of someone's light breath up against the microphone. Me and Becky were still sat there frozen in fear. I pipe up enough courage to say, Hello? But nobody answers. The breathing just continues. At this point, the guy hangs up, or the woman. I had no idea who was behind the phone, but I could tell someone was, as I could hear their breathing. Around a couple seconds later, I immediately get a text saying, Hey, the text was from the number. I reply back saying, Hey, who is this? Then the person replies saying, Good to see you. It's Becky's mum. How have you been, Sarah? I look up at Becky, holding the phone in her direction to show her the text. Her eyes broaden, and we are both staring at each other in complete shock. With that, I put the phone down and run to the front living room. I pick up the home phone and dial 911 immediately. It took a couple hours for an officer to come out, but we had to go back down and have the investigators look at everything. After all this, to cut the long story short, in an investigation period that took two whole weeks, the person that had put the Craigslist ad up for the missing connections was somebody who was part of a network. A network that kidnaps and abducts girls. What they do is research the girls from local high schools, find out their photos, their names, and the school teams they're on, and then they post the ad with details pretending to try and know them. This was an organized network, and they had done a lot of research into my life at high school. They knew what team I played for, they knew my best friend Becky, and they knew all of my things about my date of birth. Unfortunately, the police couldn't track anything, even the number was impossible for them to trace. Shortly after this, the ad disappeared off of Craigslist, and we never heard anything else from them. To this day, when I think about this, it still gives me the chills. The investigators and police told me that their goal is to get you to meet up with them, pretending to be someone that you used to know or they think you know. It's potluck really, as most times they get the information wrong, or make up stories that wouldn't be believable for the victim involved. It has happened in the past though, where there have been cases of the people meeting up with the network and never being seen ever again. I was looking for a new place to move out. I needed somewhere where I could share because I didn't have enough money to live on my own. I didn't like the idea of living in a flat, so I started scrolling through Craigslist looking for house shares only. After a while I stumbled upon a bunch that were actually in my local area. Loads of them were within my budget and looked pretty nice. I contacted some of them through the advert and started talking on my phone. A lot of them left numbers, so I just text whoever posted the ad. Long story short, I ended up getting to this place that was like really quiet, kind of secluded on the edge of the state. It was nice though. There were two other housemates, a guy and a girl. With the time, I wasn't really very social, but I got on quite well with these two. After the first week, things were going really well, until eventually, I learned that the girl, Daisy, or we'll call her Daisy, had a crazy ex. 
Her ex-boyfriend had been stalking her for the best part of almost 10 years. On and off though, he would take a couple years break and then start again. When I started to get to know Daisy better, she explained the whole situation of what happened. It was real personal and I felt bad for her at times. She would get the occasional call, letter, but after a while it would end. The police were aware of this, and at its worst, he had to be arrested multiple times. For my first two weeks of settling in, it wasn't bad at all. I didn't hear anything from her crazy ex, and I got on real well with my two new housemates. The house was spacious, and it was surrounded by hills. Hills with grass on top, and a bunch of hikers would often walk past. That was about the only awkward or negative thing about this house, was the hikers being, well, awkwardly close, walking along the trails. We had plenty of driveway space, we had three garages, and the rent came out as super reasonable. After the third week, I started to get to know my two housemates pretty well, but things started to go downhill real fast when again, Daisy started receiving phone calls from her ex. Somehow, he had got hold of this new number, this guy was like some damn agent, he would just track her down like an expert. This time, we had to disconnect the phone, otherwise it would just ring all night long. This guy was mentally insane, and apparently had even been sectioned at one point, but released after a couple years. I had to reconnect the phone one morning because I had to make a call to my family and my battery on my mobile was dead. I forgot to disconnect it again because Daisy had told us not to leave it on because of him. So later that day we kept receiving calls from him. This time I pick up the phone. He mistakens me for Daisy and starts screaming down the line. He was cussing like mad and sounded so enraged that he wanted to kill someone. I just said Daisy's not here sorry and put the phone straight down. Probably the worst thing I could have ever done in that moment. You see, the calls continued, even after we disconnected the phone. Not only was he now calling her mobile, but he was calling mine. I had no idea how he'd got hold of my mobile, but now, the rest of that night was tense and extremely uncomfortable for all of us in the house. The next morning comes and we basically got no sleep because we were constantly worrying about the phone calls. Next thing I know we had to disconnect the phone forever because it was just getting so bad that the second we reconnected it he would just start calling as if he was there all day long just calling non-stop from wherever he was. I was looking for a relaxing house share, an affordable one and one that I could actually get work done in. This was starting to turn into a nightmare, but it turns out it had only just begun. Daisy would continually block his new numbers, but he never quit. This guy was spending money out of his own pocket just to stalk her and annoy her. It got so bad that she had to keep changing her own numbers. Before she could change her number again, the next morning he called and she picked up. She drops the phone and just starts crying and I remember hearing her drop the phone. I go and see if it's okay and see that the call is still active. No one's hung up. I put the phone to my ear and he's just whispering in weird tones to himself. He starts talking about how he's going to hurt her, torture her, put her up on the wall and all these weird sick things that I don't even want to repeat. The next thing he realizes is that I'm actually listening to him. And he goes, hello? Who's this? And I just say, it's Daisy's housemaid. If you don't stop calling, we're going to get the police involved again. Please stop. Then, next thing I realize, he says something so bizarre and so outlandish that I couldn't quite believe he said it. He said, look outside your window. I did, the window to the right of a living room at this house, the one that looked out over the hills, the tallest grass verge. 
He says, you see that verge? Yeah, that hill. I'll be stood on that tonight, watching you all. I didn't believe a single word he said, even after all the signs that this guy was a committed stalker. I didn't actually believe for a second that one, he even knew where the house was, or two, had the balls to stand on that hill and stare at us all night long. The wind used to get real bad out here, because we were near the coastline. Well, sure enough, I'm going to bed, so's Daisy, and our third housemaid just stays up, usually till one or two in the morning, sat in the living room watching TV or scrolling through his phone. The next thing I notice, I've been asleep for about an hour, and I get a knock at the door. I go to my bedroom door and unlock it. I open it and see my other housemaid stood there, worried. He signals me to come over by shaking my hand. He pulls it and then tells me to come over to the living room window. That's where he points, and we can see a man holding a flashlight stood on the grass verge. It wasn't far at all. It's maybe 50 meters at most. I can see he reaches into his pocket and puts a phone by his ear. Then, around 10 seconds pass, and we'll call him Dave, our third roommate. His phone starts ringing. We look at each other in absolute shock and disbelief. I go to grab Daisy and wake her up by banging on her door. I was on the verge of tears, and sure enough, Dave answers his mobile, and it's the boyfriend. This guy had not been even taken seriously up until this point by me or Dave, but I think Daisy knew something. That's why she broke down in tears that day and dropped her phone when he got her number once again. I died 911 immediately, but he never came any closer to the property. After making the call to Dave's mobile, he turned around, switched off his flashlight, and disappeared. We told the police roughly where he was stood, and they searched briefly, but that was it. They claimed that he was on public land, and that he was allowed to be there. As long as he doesn't enter the property, or do anything more, there's nothing they can really do. That's what makes these types of cases so difficult. Harassment and stalking is an extremely fine line of breaking the law. And those who are psychotic and extremely intelligent with manipulation know how to use it to their advantage. To this day, we haven't heard anything more from him. He continues to try and call Daisy, but she keeps replacing her sim until eventually he just gives up.